assembly were all ready to proceed. So yes, that's fine. Okay, continue. Uh, hello everyone, how oh, exciting. Uh, my name is Ras Samira and I am uh, the <clears throat> chair of uh, Council of uh, Museum Israel. I'm very happy to be here and open this beautiful and impressive project, Museum Restart, uh, built by, an, by experts from the uh, United States and uh, Israel and deal with the changes and global uh, uh, changes and, and goals following the global uh, epidemic uh, COVID-19 in the world of uh, museums. The series is a collaboration of uh, ICOM Israel uh, in, re in a partnership with the USA Embassy and the Smithsonian uh, Institution. So I'm yeah, very excited. Uh, before we begin, I would like to personally thank Mrs. Uh, Nava Kessler, the former uh, chairperson of ICOM Israel and to uh, Paulina uh, Levy Ashkenazi, cultural program from USA Embassy in Israel. Together they created this wonderful series of uh, lecture built on uh, the joint thinking with our forum uh, managers with American experts from different museums. Uh, thanks, uh, thank, you, thank you very much uh, to Galit Gaon, Dr. Lior Zaltzman, Efrat Heberman, and, and Shiri Yagamuchi Miller for their uh, very important input for that. I am pleased to invite the embassy uh, re representative, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, to, to deliver an uh, opening uh, speech, Mrs. Paulina Levy Ashkenazi. Uh, please. Thank you very much, Raz. And hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here because started thinking of this series 10 months ago and here the child is finally born <laughs> and uh, this is really really exciting for all of us and thank you all for joining this opening session it is a series of uh, really fascinating lectures and workshops delivered to us by the experts uh, from the Smithsonian Institution and some other museums in the United States. We, the US Embassy in Israel, see an amazing opportunity in this series to exchange knowledge and expertise in this field uh, with between Israeli and American museum professionals. Uh, definitely, you know, we see it as an um, opportunity in the world of challenges now, the challenges brought to us by the pandemic and also by the recently by the very um, problematic security situation in Israel, which only added to those challenges. So we definitely see it as an opportunity to you know, think about new ideas and ask ourselves the question, how the museums should be dealing with this new world order. Do the museums just, you know, go back to what it was before the pandemic or do the museums will uh, have this opportunity to rethink, redesign and uh, recreate themselves in a way that make them more relevant to the community, more open to the community, connected and uh, to be the, uh, engine and then factor of the positive change in their community. And uh, I think this series uh, can give some answers or at least start the conversation. Um, we definitely want it to be a practical tool for all of you. And uh, we uh, think that it will. And this uh, session today, this workshop today is a hands-on workshop. So you definitely will be getting some practical tools of it. And I would like to thank you, Carolyn Royston from the Cooper Hewitt uh, Museum of Design in New York for being with us today. She's our amazing lecturer today with an Im immense amount of experience all over the world. This is really a great honor for us. Thank you, Carolyn. And I would specifically want to, uh, to thank our friends at the Smithsonian Institution. We have two representatives here, Aviva Rosenthal and Elizabeth Tunig. Thank you very much. Also, thank you to Susan, also from the Smithsonian, who is not here with us as far as I can see, but uh, they helped us tremendously 
with this program by their advice and pointing us in the direction of the amazing speakers and making the connections. Thank you so much. Um, I would like also to thank all the staff of the ICOM Israel, uh, Nava and Raz and all the forum heads and Mayan and Mai and all the staff of ICOM Israel. Thank you very much for facilitating, for thinking together, for your input, for you know everything that you have done to make this program possible. And um, yeah, and I hope you will sign up for other lectures as well and uh, enjoy them and learn and, uh, you know, offer your own experience to our American colleagues in the American museums as well, because uh, I don't know if our American guests here know, but Israel is the country with the greatest number of museums per capita. So something to be proud of uh, and definitely also something to be to to learn from and uh, uh, you know, it's an exchange after all. It's a cultural exchange and this is what it should be. So thank you very much. I hope you will have an enjoyable uh, workshop and an enjoyable series. Good luck to us all. Um, thank you. Thank you, Paulina, for the warm, warm word. And uh, I am pleased to invite Mrs. Uh, Aviva Rosenthal, Director of International Relationship uh, at the uh, Smithsonian Museum to speak and again thank you Viva for being a major part of this project. No thank you this is so exciting to actually be here for a museum's restart and thank you for helping me uh, inviting me to come welcome everyone this is a real pleasure to be here with ICOM Israel and the U.S. Embassy Jerusalem representing the Smithsonian Institution to help kick off what I know will already be a fascinating and energizing program. You're very lucky to have Carolyn uh, be the first speaker. I can tell you that you're in for a real treat. Um, I also wanna let you know that for me personally, this is just really exciting for me to come speak to you all. Um, Israeli museums are a formative part of my youth, actually. I still remember being eight or nine, going to the children's wing of the Israel Museum, making mosaics as a kid. I know that that was truly a groundbreaking concept at the time. I think that children's wing has probably been open since the 1960s. And I think it was really um, one of the forerunners in learning about children's education in museums. So that was really exciting for me as a child. Uh, but as you guys know, dialogues that encourage the advancement and exchange of learning are very much at the core of what Smithsonian does. In fact, our Smithsonian mission is and always has been the increase and diffusion of knowledge. The Smithsonian has been a globally facing organization since our founding in 1846, which of course for Americans sounds like a long time ago for Israelis, not so much, um, but we have been active um, in over hundred uh, countries each year. For those on the call that, that don't are not familiar with the Smithsonian, we are considered basically the national museums of the United States. We are actually 19 separate museums. We have the national zoo, nine global research centers that span diverse disciplines and topics. And we have a responsibility to, to engage on those pressing global challenges of our time from climate change to public health, from economic disparities to issues of diversity, equity, access and inclusion, the solutions to which require an international vision and perspective. As an institution, we have much to share with and learn from colleagues around the world as we tackle these challenges together. Our museums confront contemporary topics related to culture and science, but they also investigate history and the past, seeking to understand how humans and nature have shaped and been shaped by one another. We can't do that without understanding the diverse perspectives of colleagues worldwide. Working with and through partners is critical to achieving the global impact we aim to have. You know, as an example of diversity of our topics, which I'm sure you all experience, I'll just tell you about our museums are reopening. We have a couple of new exhibitions coming up, which kind of show that diversity of subject matter. Um, in our Natural Museum of Natural History, we'll open an exhibition called Challenging the Face of Science, the Bearded Lady Project, which highlights the unsung achievements of female paleontologists and examines obstacles they face because of their gender. In August, the National Portrait Gallery will open Hung Lu, Portraits of Promised Lands, which examines a Chinese American artist whose work exemplifies the stories of those who have historically been invisible or unheard. Challenging accepted histories has become an important concept for us at the Smithsonian. And in many ways, the pandemic has forced us to do that in ways big and small. Being large and experienced didn't necessarily mean we had been preparing for a pandemic. Like many museums, new challenges emerged that required thoughtful response. For the Smithsonian, we took the opportunity to carefully uh, and critically 
uh, think about not only how we engage with our publics in terms of content and format, but also how we operate it internally. I'm sure many of you have experienced the same thing. Uh, both through necessity and creativity, Smithsonian's response to the pandemic helped us stay relevant at a critical time and helped us think about how to improve for the future. Our digital resources and programs thrived and content for people of all ages was both developed but also pushed out in new ways. But we made some critical internal changes as well. We actually invested in a timed ticketing system. And for us, this was actually rather radical because the Smithsonian is at completely free and drop in. We don't have tickets. Um, so this was very new for us to have to switch to that kind of a system. We worried that it would keep visitors away, but we're already seeing the benefit of having more information about who's coming and who's not so that we can be a more inclusive organization. And while digital outreach was obviously central to staying relevant during the museum's closure, we also acknowledged that there is a digital divide and digital inequities forced us to consider how to reach the broadest range possible of American students. One of those results was that we actually did a print collaboration with USA Today, uh, which allowed the Smithsonian to distribute a free at-home summer learning guide for K through eighth grade learners, featuring bilingual English and Spanish content. It was called Summer Road Trip. This was last summer, and it was a 40-page print activity guide that used the Smithsonian's collections to take young learners on a summer road trip of uh, discovery through hands-on activities and puzzles and games. Um, we've actually now repeated that print concept a couple of times. Ultimately, in true resourceful museum fashion, we acknowledge that the COVID-19 crisis presented the Smithsonian with an imperative and an opportunity. How do we learn from the crisis, change to adapt to the new normal, and emerge as a better organization? In 2020, when we were figuring out how to reopen safely, the first time, now we're opening again, second time, hopefully the last time, our Smithsonian secretary said, at a time of pain, we need institutions that remind us of beauty. At a time of divisiveness, we need museums to remind us we've been through this before. So I leave you with that. I hope you guys have an incredible program. Uh, really looking forward to learning from you all as we share what we're doing here at the Smithsonian. And hopefully you'll all end this whole session energized and ready to help museums restart. Thank you guys so much for having us at the Smithsonian here with you. Thank you very much, uh, Aviva, for your wonderful things and uh, what you said. It, uh, we have to think about this, and I hope the, this series and projects will be part of the questions we'll answer. Uh, and finally, I'm happy to invite Carolina Royston, the Chief Experience Officer at the Cooper High Smith, Smithsonian Museum in New York, to start the first part of two meetings, end of work. Uh, thank you all again and good luck to all. <clears throat> thank you so much and um, thank you for those wonderful introductions and Aviva you couldn't have set me up better for, for this session today um, where we're going to be talking about developing digital strategies and, and how we emerge um, into the world, into a post-pandemic world and really look at how to create opportunities out of the crisis um, that we've that we've all been through. Um, I I just first of all want to say um, hello to everybody and to thank you all for for signing up uh, today, and um, also to the uh, following session in in a few weeks. Um, it's personally um, uh, really um, wonderful for me to be talking to you. Um, I, I was reminded this morning when we were doing our test uh, before, before I came on um, that I very proudly have next to me on my desk here at home um, my bronze medal from the Maccabee Games in 1985, um, which is, um, I was, I was, I was, I was a very small child then, let's just say that. Um, but I, I won it for golf. Um, and, I, and as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm actually British. Um, and I was, representing, um, I was representing Great Britain in those games. And um, it was uh, a really wonderful experience that uh, I still look back on very, very fondly today. And, um, you know, feel very connected to, to Israel and, um, and so it really is a personal honor for me to be speaking with you today. So thank you so much for, for inviting me and for signing up. So I'm gonna share my screen now so that, so that we can uh, get started. Um, 
Oh, I think one minute, um, yes. Uh, in this, um, when the time, and I just want to ask all of you to open the cameras because it's not easy to talk about the cameras. Okay. Caroline, you can try it now. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Excellent. Okay. So I'm just now uh, hopefully going into full screen mode. There we go. Um, Great. Um, so today I'm going to be um, doing a little bit of talking. I hope that we'll have an opportunity to have more of a conversation um, throughout. And I please want, I do really want to encourage you to, oops, uh, to ask questions um, during the session, um, you know, as, uh, if, if, if possible in English. Um, but, if, but if you need to do them in Hebrew, um, I, hopefully they can be translated for me um, because I do want to make sure that you have an opportunity to interact and then we'll have a point in the session as well where we will have a little discussion and again I'd really love to encourage you to to, to participate um, and and share your experiences the more that I understand about um, what what your actual experience is the, the, the I hopefully the more helpful I can be so the session um, today is about thinking digitally how to create a digital strategy and mindset in your museum and um, as I uh, as I mentioned um, we, we're actually there's actually I'm actually doing three presentations over the course of the next month um, with you and I know that um, the, these first two sessions are linked, um, and the third one is um, is uh, a little bit different. People don't have to have been on the on the on the first two, but but if you want to join all three sessions, you would be very very welcome. Um, if you can if you can bear me for three sessions, <laughs> um, but just to say today's session, um, we're going to focus mainly on where to start when you consider creating a digital strategy and how to develop that strategy. What, what approaches, what elements do you really need to be thinking about in your organization? And then I'm going to give you a little bit of homework, um, which I hope you will be able to do between the first and the second session. Um, I used to be a, a primary school teacher in, in England many years ago, so I, <clears throat> I still refer to things as homework. Um, <clears throat> but, but essentially this is, going away and um, practicing some of the things that we have talked about today. And then when we gather together again in um, three weeks um, on July 14th, um, I hope that we'll be able to review um, what you've done together, uh, talk a little bit about what you learned as a result of doing this work, um, suggestions to help you where perhaps it's been um, more difficult um, or more challenging and then what what are the next steps that you can do so I hope that over the course of these two sessions it will um, it will feel very practical and that you will have things that you can go back to your museums with um, to work on um, and, um, and 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 share um, the final session which is um, later in July is is talking a little bit more about how to integrate the digital with the physical experience um, in your museum and how to create more of a holistic approach to thinking about visitor experience across your, uh, across your museum. And so those first two sessions, the first two sessions are, are really focusing on digital and the third one is then taking, to really talking about how you take a digital strategy and make sure that it's aligned with your entire museum experience. So that's what we are going to be doing together over the next month. Um, and as I said, I'm really excited about working with you. And I hope over the course of the, 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 the month that um, you'll, you'll, you'll develop some useful tools and strategies, but also that I will learn a lot about um, your challenges and your situation in museums. So um, before we really get into the meat of the um, presentation, I thought it might be useful to give you a little bit of background about me um, and who I am. Um, and uh, I have worked in museums now for 25 years, um, which is a long time. Um, I've 
Uh, I started out as I was a teacher, I came into museums really from a learning, digital learning perspective, really at the start of e-learning when uh, learning was, was, was still really done on CD-ROMs and children had a computer in the, in the classroom. Um, and, uh, and then moved more into digital engagement, so, so wider digital uh, delivery. And uh, now at Cooper Hewitt, oh, I think there's some, I think could everybody make sure they're on mute? Second, yes. Um, I'm not the host, אז uh, אני מבקשת מכולם בבקשה שישתיקו את המיקרופונים, זה קצת מפריע. סיגל זה שלך, סיגל. I'm sorry, Caroline, a few seconds. I'm just not the host, so... One minute. Okay. You can continue now. Sorry. No problem at all. Apologize. Uh, no problem. Um, and, and most recently at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, where I'm Chief Experience Officer, I'm looking more broadly at museum experience, so not just the digital. And I'll talk more about that um, in a minute. Um, I've worked at very different types of museums with diverse collections that include history and contemporary art, history and social history, uh, decorative arts and design, and also performing arts and gardens. So I've had the whole kind of breadth of experience um, around, I think only, the only thing that's missing is a science museum from that, uh, from that, from that uh, deck, of, deck of cards. Um, and I've also been heavily involved throughout my career in leadership development. Um, in 2017, I was president of the Museum Computer Network, um, MCN, which some of you may be familiar with, but it's the professional um, association for museum technologists um, in, in pr primarily in the United States, but, but does uh, operate internationally. And I was on their board for five years. Um, and I've also completed two leadership development courses one very recently on uh, the Oxford Cultural Leadership Program, um, where the focus of the course was on leadership in times of crisis. So very relevant and helpful for this moment. Um, and in 2017, I was a Getty Leadership Institute Fellow. Um, so I have um, a lot of experience at a lot of different levels um, and, um, and hopefully um, you'll benefit from that today in terms of um, in terms of our, our talk. So um, just really briefly, um, the museums that I have worked in, um, I started my museum career at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, um, which is the, um, uh, I guess, the world's leading museum in decorative arts. Um, and I was, uh, when I was there, I led a very large uh, flagship project called the National Museums Online Learning Project. And this was a project that was about really for the first time, um, really you, museums were really thinking about how to use digital collections. There had been a very large digitization program that had happened in the UK. And this was about how to take those collections and provide better public access. Um, this was very early days. This project was 2006 to 2009. Um, and it was the first time that nine UK national museums worked together on a public facing project. The VNA was the lead partner, British Museum, Tate, uh, the Natural History Museum, the National Portrait Gallery and others were in this project. Um, and it was um, uh, very challenging from a stakeholder management perspective, but extremely rewarding in terms of the partnership building and um, in terms of what we produced for the public. I then moved to the Imperial War Museum in London um, and was direct, their first director of digital in uh, 2009. And I was there for five and a half years. Um, this is an incredible museum. Uh, for those of you that, that, that don't know it, um, it is five sites that include uh, the flagship site in, uh, in South London, um, Imperial War Museum London, um, the Churchill War Rooms, uh, which sit underneath the Treasury Building, and uh, sort of um, uh, left as a moment in time from when Churchill uh, was stationed there during the Second World War. 
Um, HMS Belfast, which is a, a battleship that was is one of the few remaining ships from uh, left from D-Day. Um, and IWM Duxford, which is um, uh, a working airfield and the largest European aviation museum. Um, and then a fifth museum, IWM North, um, designed by Daniel Liebskind and opened um, in 2000, um, which is, which is uh, uh, a sort of general um, museum um, around uh, conflict. And the incredible thing about the Imperial War Museum is that um, despite the name of the title, which is possibly one of the worst names in uh, in museum in museums that exist today, it's got it's got Imperial War um, in its title, which is not terribly welcoming for people. It is actually a social history museum, and the museum itself centers on um, on the impact of war on people's lives. It's a social history museum, and so really understanding the very best of life and the very worst of life and how we tell those stories about the impact both for people that have served and continue to serve in theaters of war, uh, as well as people on the home front and other nations that are impacted. So it's an incredible museum with an incredible collection that is actually contemporary. Um, the museum was founded during the First World War in 1917. And so it has a very modern uh, uh, collection, which from a digital perspective, really enables you to utilize the collection in ways to tell incredible, compelling stories to help people to understand um, the impact of war and conflict on, on their lives. Quite differently, I moved, I was a consultant for a while, and then I moved to, to America, where I actually had grown up um, and went back to um, uh, after a 30 year gap. Um, and I moved to Boston to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, which again is a pretty incredible museum, a jewel in the crown for the United States. It's small, um, but has probably the finest historic art collection in the United States. Every, every, uh, every piece painting um, is, is really a jewel. And, the museum was founded by Isabella Stewart Gardner, who was a philanthropist uh, at the turn of the, of the, of the uh, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. She only collected for 10 years. She was collecting at the same time as some he very heavyweight industrialists like Rockefeller and Guggenheims and Andrew Carnegie, but she was wily and very clever and really um, managed to amass this incredible collection. She built this museum and li actually lived in it on, the, on this top floor. And it has the most incredible atrium at the center of the museum, absolutely beautiful with a, a glass ceiling that she uh, helped to architect and a living collection in the gardens. Um, the, the collection that you see here, the gardens that you see here are changed seven times uh, over the course of the year, um, seasonal changes, and all of the gallery windows face into the atrium. Um, so it's a feature really throughout the whole museum experience. The atrium itself is an absolute wow moment um, and is a, um, uh, a place of real serenity. Um, and the museum, she curated the museum herself. And when she died, she stipulated in her will that nothing could change in the museum. And if anything changed without permission from the attorney general um, in uh, Massachusetts, that the museum would shut down and the entire collection would go to Harvard, the Harvard University. So um, it's, it is also a moment in time. And so one of the challenges with this museum is how to remain relevant and resonant. If somebody comes and says, you know, well, I was there 10 years ago, why would I visit? Nothing's changed. Um, so a very different kind of visitor experience to sort of bring it into the present and to work with um, a permanent collection that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't change and how to bring new stories, um, new learning, new interpretation around, um, around the museum. And this is a really great example of the quirkiness and the eccentricity of Mrs. Gardner in that this is a, a painting um, by John Singer Sargent. Um, and she has placed this in, um, in an alcove, uh, which you can't really see, but it's surrounded by Mexican murals from a church. Um, it has Chinese um, sculpture at the base. 
and there are no labels. So the entire music museum is really for her was about personal meaning making. What does it mean to me if I'm standing in front of an object? Um, how do I interpret that? And it would be different for me than it would be for all of you. Um, and so again, a very challenging visitor experience because for some visitors, they love that. They love to be able to stand in objects, in front of objects and have their own, make their own meaning making, their own interpretation. And for others, it's very frustrating because their learning style is, I want to know what this painting is. I want to know about the painter. I want to know about the media. Um, tell me why, why, why are Mexican murals surrounding this painting? Why has she chosen to do this? And she never wrote anything down. So we don't actually know why she did some of the eccentricities that she did, but it's kind of fascinating and a feature of the museum. And this is the other huge feature of this museum. It is um, a museum that has got to this day, the largest art heist in the United States. Um, in 1993, um, the museum um, was uh, the victim of a heist uh, that only lasted 20 minutes. Um, but in that 20 minutes, they took 13 of the masterpieces, including a Vermeer, of which he only painted 38 paintings in his entire career, um, a Rembrandt, um, a Turner, and some other incredible masterpieces. They've never been found. There is a $10 million reward still out with the FBI. Um, and the museum has left the empty frames uh, on the wall um, as a reminder of those paintings and the, and the hope that they will come home one day. So an incredible story uh, to go with the whole mythology of this museum and a reason that people visit. Um, they'll come into the museum and they'll say, where are the empty frames? So again, you know, how do you build that story, that interpretation into the fabric of the museum? So, and then finally, uh, where bring, bringing you up to date with today, um, this is the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, another incredible building, uh, the home of Andrew Carnegie, the industrialist. Um, it's a mansion, literally, that is uh, on Fifth Avenue um, and is in an area of New York called Museum Mile. So um, two blocks down, uh, you have the Guggenheim Museum, um, a block over. Uh, on the other side, you have the Jewish Museum. Um, you also have the Met. Uh, three or four blocks down and the Museum of uh, New York. So it's a, as, as well as several other prominent museums the Neuer Gallery, et cetera. So it's a, it's a real tourist um, area. It's a place where people will come um, and maybe do several museums in one day. Um, they will um, uh, come, come across, stumble across the, the Cooper Hewitt. Um, perhaps it's not as well known as some of its bigger neighbors. Um, but it is America's National Design Museum and, um, and it has an important collection um, spanning uh, many, many centuries. Um, the museum is, um, was closed in uh, 2012 and reopened in 2014 after a reno major renovation. It's a beautiful, beautiful building um, that is um, the, the, the architecture and the design of the building um, is one of the one of the main attractions of of the museum, um, and the galleries themselves are, are are very magnificent. And it's an interesting museum for it to be a design museum and a design museum that has both a historic and a contemporary uh, collection and exhibitions, and um, and how those fit together with the architecture and design of the, of the, of the mansion is, is one of the challenges actually that we have as a museum, just in terms of the, you know, not taking away from the design of the museum itself and not having the architecture and the exhibition design fight with, e fight with each other. So how do, we, how do we work with the collection? And also interestingly in 2014, the museum reopened with an enormous amount of technology and uh, that technology some of you may know about um, included these very large digital tables which are positioned throughout the museum and the pen which is um, the interpretive tool that was given to out to all visitors who purchased a ticket and um, and this enabled them to collect information on the labels of the objects as they were walking around and then to use the pen on the tables to both um, download what they had collected to look at in more detail, 
um, also do some um, design work themselves using the pen um, as a design tool. And um, in the middle of this table, you can see something called the river, which is essentially the, um, a selection of the collection, which is available in a digitized form for people to select and look at and also to save if they want to. The other element of the pen is that you are able to create an account at home and to access everything that you have done at the museum. And in 2014, the idea really was to ask people to put their phone away um, and to really look um, at the collection and use the pen as a collecting tool so that you didn't have to worry about taking photographs and that you didn't have to worry about taking photos of the labels, um, that, that all, of your, uh, all of your journey could be um, collected and retrieved um, later. Um, the other part of this is something called the immersion room or also known as a wallpaper room. And you can see here that there is a digital table in the space. Um, in this room, uh, visitors are able to use uh, wallpaper that is already um, uh, part of the collection at the Cooper Hewitt. It has one of the largest wallpaper collections in the United States, but also they can design their own wallpaper. And this was um, something that visitors love and continue to love despite the age of the, um, of the interactivity, uh, the interactive and technology today. Um, and as you can see here, it became a, a, a major attraction to do selfies. So it's been very, very useful for the museum to have a place where people can um, be creative, save what they've created, share it in a, in a, in, 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 in a, in, on Instagram and on Twitter, um, and also for it to promote the museum in a way across social media in a way that um, is much more powerful than we could do ourselves. It's always good to have um, your users, um, your, your, your visitors be the voice of your institution wherever it's possible on social media. Um, and so these were the main interactive uh, elements that the museum opened with in 2014. And interestingly, now in 2021, and also, you know, due to the pandemic, we are in the midst of creating a new guest experience. Um, we will keep the interactive tables in some form um, and evolve them and uh, think about new interactive, um, new, new ways of interacting and new types of content and new, new forms of interaction on those tables. Um, and think about how we want to develop the immersion room into a, a kind of more up-to-date immersive space. Um, and we will be sunsetting the pens. Um, one, because of COVID and the whole touch um, aspect, but also because the technology now has kind of reached the end of its shelf life. And we want to create more multiple kinds of experiences rather than just collecting. So we're in that stage at the moment where we are developing a guest and experience strategy. And I'll talk more about that in the third um, session that we have together later in July. Um, but that is a really um, important part of my work um, at the moment. So I just wanted to give you a sense of, of where we are today um, and, and, and also just a little bit about my background um, and, and, um, and my experience. So the focus today is I wanted to talk, um, I mean, Aviva, Aviva and, and Polina both touched on this in their introductions, but COVID and the changing conditions, what does this mean for us um, in museums? And, um, and what do we mean by digital uh, when we talk about it? It's a word that gets used a lot and thrown around a lot. And I think has many different meanings for different people, which is absolutely fine. But I want to just dig in a little bit to what we mean by digital. Um, I'd like to show you just a few museum examples, just some things that I have noticed over the last year that other museums, not, not my own, have been doing that have used some different um, platforms um, to, uh, to, to talk about and, and to sort of be relevant and resonant and they're ones that I like very much and, and I'd like to share those with you. And then I'd like to finish the session with where do you start? So when we talk about creating a digital strategy, what are the things we need to do to put ourselves in, in a position where we can actually do it and also do it at a, at, 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 a, at a pace and scale that's right for our museum with the right kinds of resource 
and capacity. I know that on this call, there are a number of museums that are um, very small and, 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 and maybe are not able to do as much and others that have got more capacity and more resource to do more. All of those things are okay. The most important thing is that you work from where you are. Um, you, you know, if you're a small museum, you don't want to try and be the Met. Um, you know, if you're, if you're a bigger museum, then maybe you have more ambition, but, but to really understand and for whatever that you do from whatever place that you start, that you're doing things that are manageable um, and uh, sustainable and, um, and have impact for your audience. Um, and that is a really, really important message um, that I want to say now and will mention many times over the course of our time together. It's really about managing, sustaining and impact. So let's just talk for a moment about the impact of COVID and the changing conditions. I think you'll all be familiar with these things. Nothing will be new here, but I think it's interesting to, um, to, just, to just restate. The world changed overnight, <laughs> literally, um, and we closed our doors. Um, Cooper Hewitt closed its doors on March 13th, 2020. We only just reopened on June 10th, 2021. Um, unlike some other Smithsonian units, we did not reopen. The New York, New York was the epicenter of the pandemic um, at the beginning of the crisis. We were in a very severe lockdown. And, um, and by the time we were coming out of it in New York, the United States was having another wave and, um, and we were advised not to open. So even though other museums in New York opened uh, in around September and October of last year, Cooper Hewitt remained closed. Um, we, we became museum was without walls, um, no longer constrained by our physical buildings. Um, suddenly we were um, able to think about uh, a museum, our museums in very, very different ways and less focus on local audiences or tourists coming through our doors. And actually the world suddenly became our audience or uh, we went from a local to a national to an international audience. And we found, certainly at Cooper Hewitt, and I'd be interested to know if this is the case for you in, in Israel, we started to see much greater reach and also new audiences. So people, uh, we were able to reach audiences that weren't necessarily people that had visited the museum before or, um, or perhaps, you know, design wasn't their primary interest but through the content that we were putting out, through our working more closely with other Smithsonian units, because we were in a digital space, because we were able to make more links, we suddenly found that we were able to attract, uh, attract new audiences that, that we hadn't before. And digital became the only way to bring our collections and programs to those we serve. So how interesting you know, especially someone from a digital, coming from a digital background, where I'm constantly saying in all the museums that I've worked in, we must think about digital, it's not an add on, it's not something that is some, you know, something we think about at the very end where we just go, oh, well, we've got all this content, we'll just shove it into, you know, the website, or we'll shove it into some interactive in the museum. Suddenly, it became the core central aspect of our delivery. And that meant that every single person in the museum suddenly had to think about what does it mean in my role to contribute to digital delivery? So it was a sort of fascinating moment um, in terms of mindset change for museums. And I think what we'll talk about in a little bit later is, you know, what, 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 do we, what have we learned from that? And what do we want to take with us when we reopen our museums and people come back through our doors, um, do we want to let go of all of these things that, that, that potentially are positives to, um, to go back to how it was before? Or do we want to take elements, the things that we have learned and think about how we integrate those into a new normal for our museums? So I very quickly just want to show you some, some recent examples of um, 
things where I think museums have really excelled, and again, you may be familiar with, with some of these. Um, D Dutch museums um, are, I think, some of the best in the world at digital engagement. Um, and um, the Rijks Museum is a, is a fantastic example uh, of a national, the National Museum uh, in Amsterdam of really thinking about digital first um, right from the start. They were closed for 10 years. Um, I can't remember quite what the, whether it was sort of the early 20, 20, 2000s uh, to the early um, 2010s. And they had a lot of time to think about um, what they wanted to be when they reopened. And they, in that time, digitized their entire collection and really decided that from the, from the off that they would think about digital as a really integrated part of their experience. So they've already been, I think, ahead of the game in many cases. And I noticed recently that they have redesigned or updated their website and also introduced, um, uh, and I hope you can see this. Um, are you able to, are you able to see this? Okay, great. So they have redesigned their website um, and updated it for um, during COVID. Um, it is um, be a beautiful, beautifully designed site. Um, it is extremely visual um, and it really shows the, um, you know, what they do and their collection very simply and very vividly. And you can see that they are, you know, they have an online symposium that they are holding at the beginning of July. And then they have this new online exhibition, which I, again, I like very much, um, which is really designed for um, the online environment. So it's not just recreating, um, a, trying to recreate a physical exhibition in a, in a digital space. They've really thought about digital assets and how to use the digital medium to really talk about um, around the, about their about the exhibition and to make it a complement um, to to the exhibition rather than something that is going to fight it. I also think it's an acknowledgement that maybe people some people will never visit this exhibition. So how do you also make this a destination in its own right um, and a meaningful experience for for visitors? And 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 it's quite simple in what they've done um, in that they really have just created a, a series of stories. Um, and the stories are focused on, you know, about the people who are enslaved or who were slow, slave owners. And um, each, as you scroll down, each story, um, you know, covers a particular topic um, and um, uses um, video, um, uses photography, um, uses the historic collection and the artwork, um, uses um, uh, other assets from the collection um, and, and audio. And I, so I like this very much and it's actually very simple. The skill is about pulling the stories together. It's not the technology. You could deliver this technology on YouTube. You could de de deliver this technology through podcasting. But what's really exemplary is the storytelling. And I, I, I like that very much. So just going back now, uh, the Moritz House is another Dutch museum. Um, it's a small ha historic house museum, um, not, um, not hugely digital. Um, but during COVID, they very quickly pivoted to um, creating a virtual tour. And in this virtual tour, they offer two, um, two avenues. One is a free exploration where you can just go and look at the collection yourself um, and, and imagine yourself in this sort of 360 walking around the museum. And in the other- Welcome. My name is Martina Gosling and I'm director of the Marishuis. Mm -hmm. We've made this virtual tour of the Marishuis for you. Whether you are a regular visitor or someone who's never been to the museum before. In this digital environment, you can see all of our paintings up close and get the feeling that you have the 17th century city palace to yourself. So I, I, we don't have time to, it's, it's actually really, really great. And again, I would I highly recommend that you 
look at it. Again, it's the storytelling that is what's so great about this. This is a different example from, from the Met. Um, they create something called primers, and these primers are designed to support people, scaffold a museum visit, um, an exhibition. But again, during COVID, when people weren't visiting, um, they created these uh, primers um, for people to experience um, the exhibitions that they weren't able to see because the museum was closed. This is um, Alice Neal, which is, uh, she's an artist uh, with a, a large retrospective exhibition on at the Met at the moment. And again, it's the storytelling and highlighting the collection and using the collection in new ways that augment and add value to the exhibition, but are also something that really sits on its own um, and enables people to experience the exhibition in, um, in its own uh, right without ever being able to visit. So that again, they've used video. Um, this is from uh, primary sources that they have in their collection about the artist and in her own words. Um, and then it's just a, a kind of background story, you know, to Alice Neal and her growing up in a small town in Pennsylvania and moving to New York. Um, streetscapes, giving people an example of what it was like to be in New York at the time that Alice Neal moved there to today's world of New York um, and in the 70s when she was um, prolific. And then talks a bit more about New York and her impressions of New York and why she loved it. Um, and then shows some of the places that she lived and then, and then so on and so forth. And then you start to see about her, the, the people that she painted, about her networks, et cetera, and about her life. So it's really giving you um, a, a really um, complete picture of this artist that you can see would be great to look at before you visit but it also is great on its own out of interest um, to learn about the artist. Um, the next one I want to show you is from the Frick Museum, which is also one of uh, our neighbors in New York. And they did something quite wonderful during COVID. Um, they were closed um, and they ran a Friday uh, evening series called Cocktails with a Curator. And they did this um, on YouTube. Um, so they used their YouTube site to um, create a series every Friday with their curators that focused on one painting in their collection. And again, you know, like the gardener, they have a magnificent historic collection. Um, and their curators um, would spend 20 minutes uh, doing an in-depth uh, storytelling around their painting um, and at the same time they created a cocktail for you to drink on a Friday night um, as you're sitting watching this. Um, at its height it received over a million views um, and became uh, something that was uh, really talked about and sort of viral and the Great thing about this is that they used to run a late night when they were open, a late nights at the Frick, where they would get maybe a maximum of 200 to 300 people in the museum because that was their capacity and have a kind of late night where they would do something like this and a, a curator would talk about a show, uh, talk about a, either an exhibition or talk about a specific piece of artwork and there would be cocktails um, served at the event. And suddenly they were now getting tens of thousands of people listening to uh, essentially a similar uh, program, but they were now reaching the world rather than a local um, and fairly elite New York audience. And I think this is a great example of how COVID has um, ch changed, provided an opportunity to broaden the audience and to, to, to extend the reach. And also using a, a simple platform like YouTube that where most museums ha have some presence on today, but using it in a way that um, really created an event and a reason to be there. And finally, the, the last thing I want to show is actually a resource. This is from MCM, the Museum Computer Network, which is the um, uh, association that I told you about. And, um, what they have created, which I really um, highly recommend you going to look at, 
is during COVID, they started to gather together um, a, a list of museums that were doing online, various online activities. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a growing resource. I think they're still adding to it. But you can see there's a whole range of, uh, of museums from all over the world um, that have um, that 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 are um, uh, on the site and are accessible. Um, really great for um, just just for some research. Um, really great for ideas. You know, the other thing I want to say to you is you don't have to come up with a creative. No one has ever thought of this idea before. We all borrow, we all learn, we all build on other people's experiences. And you know, you, you work with what you have, what's special about your museum, what, what your assets are, what you, your jewels are, and, and, and look at what other people have done. So the Frick is a great example of that, you know, how to use a YouTube channel effectively, or the Moritz House, if I wanted to create a virtual exhibition, here's how I might want to consider doing it, and use those examples and build on them. So um, I, I, I'll make this presentation available, by the way, to, um, to ICOM um, uh, afterwards, so you can have access to these, to these links and, and my slides. Um, so I just wanted to really give you just a very quick, I could have shown you a hundred different other things that I have liked over the last year, but as, as someone in your position, I am looking all the time at what other museums are doing and learning. And I'm hoping that other museums are also learning from, from what we're doing. Um, and there is some very good practice out there that really is on a range of budgets um, and experience. So um, I wanted to just spend a few minutes now. I don't know if, um, if I can get out of this and go back to, um, back to the to the screen um i'd love to just um uh, ask you the question um very briefly because we only have a few minutes if, if people would just like to share some of the things that they have tried over the course of the last year um from a in a in, a, in their digital um in in virtually um and and if you could just describe briefly what you have done and what you've learned from that i i'd be super super interested to get an idea so you can raise your hand on um on uh zoom if you click on reactions um there is uh you'll see something called raise hand come up uh, and that's a really helpful way for me because I can't see all of you um, just to just to see who is um, who who is um, here and available. I think Caroline, did you did you raise your hand initially? Caroline Shapiro. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm here from the Tower of David Museum, and uh, we started a whole renewal program. Uh, of renewing the museum during the time that we were closed and we felt that we had this huge secret that we weren't being able to tell anyone and we wanted to be able to bring people in. Uh, we ended up creating a series of webinars but using a lot of video material so that people could really feel that they were um, seeing what was going on, meeting the people that were working on site. Uh, so it was more of a virtual encounter rather than a, a virtual tour. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And was that, was that something that you really did as a result of COVID or was it something that you had planned and thought about no, before? 100% in response to uh, the borders in Israel, as you may well know, were closed and still are in fact for um, uh, individual visitors that just want to get on a plane and visit. And we needed to find a way to be able to bring people really into the walls of the museum. And, um, and we were excited to be able to share the content. And we also felt that we're very, uh, you know, we did it with our friends, but we've also done it um, through different avenues as well. And have been asked as a result to do that for more people. Fantastic, that's a great story. Thank you so much for sharing. Anybody else want to share uh, something that they have done? Don't be shy. Anybody else? Anybody, do it could be a very small thing. 
Um, yes, I can see. I can see a hand raise there. Oh no, right. I can see clapping. I can see clapping. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, Yael from the Bible Lands Museum. Uh, we actually have an international program that we started, I think, four years ago, where we do um, tours of the museum via Zoom. It used to be via, I think we did it through WhatsApp video beforehand, which was horrible. Mm -hmm. um, and then we transferred into Zoom. So when the pandemic hit, we were sort of had already had one step ahead as far as um, having the know-how and we offered it to schools in Israel, obviously being able to offer it to people further away from us. Um, usually we, our normal crowd is Jerusalem and, and the area. So now we were able to get to Eilat, Kirat Shmona, um, and obviously uh, schools abroad. We also transferred, we have weekly lectures at, in the museum so we tra transfer them to Zoom, uh, hmm. but now we're actually having the opposite uh, problem where people are so comfortable staying at home that they don't want to come back. I don't. I don't. I. I. I wonder if that is going to happen. But I. But I. I. I think that's that's great. And I. I'm. I'm. I'd love to know when we when we continue. Just you know what what did we learn from that? You know what and and how can we retain those audiences um you know and the, the visiting and the digital are not the same you know they're different experience and there's nothing will ever replace seeing coming into a museum and seeing our collections in real life I, and nothing will ever 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 um uh, change that so i think it's it's less about that and more about you know how do you how do you think about those experiences working together so um, I think well, anything else another issue yeah. that you brought up with the cube with the um, the frick is what I wanted to ask was a lot of the content that we were offering and the sense that we got and I think I got it also from other museums in Israel at the time was that people are not willing to pay for online content and now That's that we're back to fully being operated we're back to working in the museum yes. therefore people have to pay admission or whatever a ticket and that's also yeah. a, a transition back, which is hard. I, 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 I agree. And I think this is another potential learning as we come out of COVID. I mean, we've always given our content away for free online. Um, and the content is valuable. You know, it's, 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 um, you know, it's, it's our hard, it's our sweat and labor that's gone into that. So um, I think it's, you know, one of the, one of the questions emerging is, you know, how do we add, how do we, how do we recognize return on investment? How do we think about content as and what we provide for our audiences in a digital world? Um, how do we how do we value that um, versus people paying to come through the door and expecting a certain experience? And I think for um, I think what's interesting is that um, in the performing arts, um, what we saw over the last year, I think was 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 a was a more of a transition to paying for content um, and kind of understanding um, about st streaming content and its value um, in a way that um, we, we haven't really got to grips with in museums. So I think it's a really good point and something definitely that's going to be um, a consideration going forward. Um, Rose, you have your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to add to that. I'm also from the Tower of David Museum, but what we've discovered actually is that content that we create that we are creating for a Hebrew-based um, population is actually um, giving us a revenue stream, and we have a series of very high-level lectures and uh, and presentations that you must uh, you must subscribe to, and we had very low expectations, I have to say, and we were very pleasantly surprised that if you get it's always the same in museums, content is king. And if you can give the content, the people will buy it. Couldn't agree more. Thank you for that. I, 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 I'm, I am someone. You'll notice that I, you know, even though I, I come from a digital background, I don't really talk about technology um, because actually, what's really interesting to me 
is content and content delivery. How do we serve that content up to people in different ways? And the technology is a means to us doing that rather than driving what we what we do. So I, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. So thank you so much for that example. Let's just take one more. I'm so pleased you're participating. I, I'm, I'm so delighted. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a question in the chat from from is it Hazy? I hope I pronounced that. I'm sorry if I haven't pronounced that correctly. Um, I, wrote project... something. I just wrote you something personal to look at. Oh, okay. Thank you. I will I will look at it. Thank you very much for sharing. All right, well, let's move on. I'm going to go back to my presentation so that we can actually get into um, this last part, which is really about how do you approach creating a digital strategy? So I'm going to share my screen again. Oops, I've been disabled. <laughs> so one second, that's weird. One minute. It's okay. Mm. This is why I don't like talking about technology. <laughs> right now thank you so much uh, okay 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 um so let's move on now um so just very briefly i mean this is again um this is from la during last year um a company um in the U in the u.s called um uh slova Lynette, who are a do audience evaluation and a uh, a, a kind of cultural um, and brand strategy agency called the Placa Cohen did some research around, uh, you know, what were they learning about museum and audience behaviors while our mu museums were closed. And I just think it's interesting, you know, I just pulled out a few things here, which is, you know, that 81% that of people wanted to do something creative during the pandemic and turned to different types of creative outlets for, for, um, for doing, uh, for helping to kind of satisfy that need. Um, we started to see more digital um, interactions, which we know, um, and for museums, it tended to be around, um, you know, if there was pre-COVID recorded performances that museums made available, um, if it was live stream performances, um, uh, uh, online activities for kids, online classes or workshops for um, continuous learning or podcasts. Audiences were really turn turning to these me different mediums uh, for um, uh, re really during the crisis. And that we basically became a virtual, this became a virtual gateway into our museums. And what we noticed or what they noticed in their study, that there was a, a huge percentage of people who were visiting various institutions across the United States virtually that didn't, that had never visited physically. So really starting to see this interesting growth in audiences. So out of a crisis comes opportunities. And, you know, this is something that I've been focusing on with my museum. Um, but I think it's some interesting learning that we can start to see emerging, some of which you have just mentioned uh, to me. Um, it really has been a chance to pause and reflect on everything that we do as a museum. Is this what we should be doing now in this moment of crisis? I mean, in the, in the United States, there was a triple crisis, the pandemic, social injustice around the George Floyd, George Floyd murder and the social um, uh, unrest, the political situation with Donald Trump and, um, and the financial impact of the pandemic. So we were dealing with multiple crises um, and uh, over the course of the year. It really gave us an opportunity to say, are we still doing what's important? Is this what our audiences need? Should we be thinking about something else? It offered an opportunity for us to introduce new ways of working. So suddenly as a closed museum, we were all working virtually. So what does this mean in terms of the way that we work? We introduced a number of new online tools at Cooper Hewitt um, that have enabled us to work together more effectively. Um, we found more cross-disciplinary working, less silos. It's been easier to meet. Um, I'm able to do this, even though I'm sitting in my apartment in New York, um, even though I'd love to be there with you in Israel. Um, but it has enabled um, really a, um, a, a really new modes of working and new ways of thinking. 
Um, it has been an opportunity and, a, and it has exposed um, the digital confidence and skills of our staff. So, you know, you would expect the people that have some kind of digital responsibility, you know, they have had an enormous amount of pressure. Um, an enormous burden has been placed on their shoulders as they've suddenly become um, critical to the mission of the museum. But what about everyone else? So we've had this opportunity to really reflect on, you know, what are the skills that a curator needs in a modern day world? What are the skills that our advancement and our fundraising people need? What are the skills that our educators need? And to really look at the levels of literacy around digital in our museums and how can we build up those skills and that confidence? And I think this has been a universal question for museums. And I know in the UK, for example, there's been an enormous amount of work done um, funded by the government to promote um, digital literacy and building digital confidence so that our museums are better prepared for the world that we are living in today. How do, our, how do we become more relevant and resonant? So again, this coming back to this question of pausing and reflecting, is our exhibition program still the program that we should be doing now as people emerge out of this crisis and into a world after what they've experienced? How can museums around questions of social injustice, around the, for many of us, the provenance of our collections, particularly in the Western world, um, the, the makeup of our collections, you know, which are predominantly white male artists, how is this relevant? How do we make this relevant? How do we come to terms with that as museums and bring our museums into conversation with the real challenges and questions that we're facing today um, in the modern world? And how do we continue to serve remote audiences? So those audiences that, that, that you have, to, some of you have described, um, that you have um, started to engage, started to develop, even after we open our doors and how do we create equitable physical and virtual experiences so we don't lose those audiences that, that have chosen to engage with us in, 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 a, in a virtual space from those audiences that still want to come through the doors. So again, what is an equitable? And by that, I mean, you know, some of those examples that I've shown you where they are destinations in their own right, but they do not replace the on-site experience. Again, I would argue these are new skills, new ways of thinking, um, new ways of interpreting and telling storytelling. And we, I think as museum professionals, need to really understand the importance of this, you know, and that will be different for different organizations. But also then, if we are going to serve remote and physical audiences, what do we need to do? How do we need to change in the way that we work, in the way that we build our skills, um, in the way that we approach our, um, our programs and content and services? So really interesting questions. I see all of these as opportunities for museums. They're, they all pose challenges, but they're all potentially opportunities. And I'm, I'm personally very excited by this. So how do you develop your strategy? If you've got all of this kind of context that you're thinking about, how do you really think about developing a digital strategy in this world? And when I talk about digital strategy, um, and this is me, um, so this is my own view, but I see it absolutely as part of an integrated museum um, uh, uh, service and offer. So the physical, your building, um, your um, access in your building, the way that people move around your building, the way that people experience your exhibitions in the building is one part. The human part are your people, your staff, those people on the ground, the people that welcome your visitors, your docents that guide and show people around your museum, your guards, um, your security, um, everybody that is a human uh, uh, element in your museum experience is part of that integrated experience. And finally, the virtual dig digital experience. And the three have to work together because if you think about a museum experience across an entire visitor journey, from the moment that people think about coming to your museum, 
to perhaps when they come to your website to find out how to visit or buy a ticket, to when they come through your doors and actually encounter the museum and uh, are welcomed at your admission desk, uh, maybe go on a tour, um, maybe um, need signposting to the restrooms or where to go in the museum, the basic, basic but important needs. Um, to um, to the um, maybe interactive elements of the visit, you know, using their using their own devices or using interactives in the museum, um, or the all or, or the experience on the on the website, or your experience in social media. How do all those things fit together? Because across that visitor journey, people are going to want different things at different times, and want that want those things served up in different ways. And the challenge for us is how do we decide what is the best intervention at the right time in, in, with the right um, delivery. And so my job now as Chief Experience Officer at Cooper Hewitt, rather than Director of Digital, is to think about all of those experiences together. So rather than, I think what we find often in museums, particularly bigger, medium to, to larger museums, is that people have very distinct roles. I do digital, I do, you know, um, I, I, I do exhibition design, I uh, manage the admission desk and think about ticketing, I do membership. Um, and very often we don't bring these things together to think about the overall and seamless experience that we should be offering for visitors. Um, and, and what that means from a brand perspective when we talk about this. So how, what is a Cooper Hewitt experience? Um, you know, what is, a, um, what is a Metropolitan Museum of Art experience? And those things will look very different for different museums, but really thinking about how these things fit together so that it feels like one experience for your visitors. And if you think about that really in a kind of graphic way, you know, and think specifically about digital, you can see how it fits into every area of our digital activity. And, you know, you may have different names for these things in your museum, but this is really about the kind of public facing digital experience, your front and back of house, the skills that you need in order to be able to deliver this, the technology that you might need in order to be able to manage this, the systems, the processes, the ways in which you work and the entire visitor experience. And what you see from this graphic is that digital permeates every area of the museum. There isn't anybody now in a museum that doesn't have some kind of digital aspect to their role. Even if it's an admin business facing role in your museum, they are still operating some kind of technical system. So really thinking about where, where digital fits in and who owns all of these elements. And again, coming back to that previous slide, how do you work together? How does this fit together? And your digital strategy, right? So I am going to give you some homework, um, which is going to be about drafting a very simple digital strategy for your museum. You may already have one, um, which will, this will be something you can build on, or it may be something you need to start from scratch, but it should be very simple. Um, and then hopefully in the session on the 14th, you're gonna share and feedback um, and talk about what you have done. And as I said, it should be a starting point for you to continue your work, to work on this with your colleagues. This is not um, you know, something where I would expect you to finish this. This may take you many months to do, or it may be something that's very simple and that you can do in a few weeks. But again, it's starting with where you are. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. You need to start with where you are. And we need to understand that all museums are in different stages of digital maturity. So across the whole uh, of this workshop, you will be, um, some of you will have done, as we've heard, a few things, and some of you will have done very little or nothing at all. All of those things are fine. Um, but your strategy needs to reflect where your organization is today. There is no point having a digital strategy that is far beyond your ambition or far beyond your capability or your capacity. That is not a strategy that is ever going to be useful or implementable. So it's really important that your strategy really reflects where you are. And it's, it's going to be really important that whether you're starting at the beginning or you're building on your existing work, 
that you have a strategy and that you have a roadmap, an implementation plan that's going to be critical to your success, because this is something that you can not only refer to as you're continuing to build um, on the work that you're doing, but it's also something to share with your organization, to share with your leadership, to help them to understand what the work is, what it involves, how much it might cost, and how long it might take. And what the, what, the, what the future is, whether this is a one to three or one to five year uh, roadmap. And it's got to be aligned, your strategy has got to be aligned with your museum's wider priorities and goals. Otherwise it will not be achievable and sustainable. So I have seen many examples of perfectly good digital strategies that bear no relevance to actually what the museum's core priorities are. So if you're a museum and your core priority is not to care about remote audiences, but only care about local audiences and getting them through the door, then how does your digital strategy align with that? There's no point having a digital strategy that says, we're gonna run a whole load of remote um, uh, public programs. We're going to put lots of um, e-learning resources on our website. Um, and we're gonna put loads of effort into our social media um, to do programs to reach out to people. What you need to be seeing in that digital strategy is how you're going to use your digital elements to help people come through the door. What do you need on your website? What do you need in terms of promotion and marketing to get people to come through the door, et cetera. So they must be aligned and you must be able to map the two together. Otherwise, it really is um, not achievable and not sustainable. And nobody in the organization will buy into it. So people need to see the impact and need to see the relevance. And the good news is it's never too late to start. So if you haven't been thinking about digital to date or you don't know where to start and it's all just too overwhelming, it doesn't matter. You can start tomorrow. You can even start today at 10.31 when this session ends. Um, and the sort of bad news is it the work never ends. So you... Um, you, you, we are only going to become more digital. We are only going to become more reliant on digital um, delivery, on di digital infrastructure, on digital technology, and our audiences are going to become increasingly digital literate, digitally aware, and have an expectation that we are going to be able to service them in, these, in the spaces that they want to be in. So I, whilst you may not have started yet, I think it's going to be very, very difficult if you are going to remain relevant and resonant in today's world to not be thinking about your digital presence and, um, and how you're going to do that. So some important things to remember as we embark on this, you know, every museum is unique, but we all share some common characteristics. We have a collection, we deliver programs, we have audiences. Um, so again, you know, starting where you are um, but understanding that we can learn from each other because we share some universal characteristics and some universal challenges. And therefore, based on that, to develop that approach that it's appropriate for your capacity, your capability, and your budget. And it's, I will always, always advise that small, impactful change is better than overambition and an inability to deliver or sustain activity long term. Um, you, 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 you will build on success, however small. Your organization will be excited and buy into small success. Your audiences will be excited by small success that has impact for them. What won't be successful is spending a lot of money and investing a lot of time and energy into something that you are going to have difficulty delivering that may take a long time where people will lose interest, you'll have project fatigue, um, and at the end it'll all be a bit disappointing. Don't do that. Really go for small, impactful change. So here are some things that your strategy might include, and I'm not going to go through all of these things, and again, I'm going to leave the slides with you so you're able to look at this in more detail. But a good museum digital strategy at the center, as I said, really needs to align with your organizational priorities um, and, the, and, and your digital vision. They need to line up um, and, and it needs to be coherent. And I would say that there are a number of elements that you might want to include or at least discuss as part of developing your strategy. And these, these, these range from your goals and your outcomes and your priorities 
um, the resources that you need, the budgets that you might need, the time frames that you might want to work in. What are the challenges? What's going to stop you? You know, and that could be <clears throat> anything from not having enough staff, not having the right the staff with the right skills, not having the budget, not having the technical infrastructure. These are all barriers which are completely understandable, very, very common, but they are your challenges. So how can you creatively think about how to overcome them? <clears throat> Are there some partnerships, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can think about developing that might help you with some of these challenges? Um, working with a university, um, working with consultants if you have um, budget, um, working with students, um, working with ICOM, working with other uh, countries, organizations, or other museums. Are there partnerships that can help you? And how into your strategy can you build this idea, this mindset of continuous improvement? Because this work will never end, because these projects don't have natural um, endpoints, how do you begin to think about, you know, we do a little bit, we review what we've done, and we build on what we've done to improve. Um, and that becomes part of our continuous way of working. Um, this is not necessarily a natural way of working in museums, particularly when we talk about exhibitions, you know, where there's long term planning and there is a clear beginning, middle and end. What we're talking about here are tensions between digital delivery and digital planning, which often takes a much shorter amount of time than an exhibition. So how do you build on this? And this is just a list um, which is uh, which I've just of, of, of that graphic, which again you can refer to. Um, it's just in a simpler way, or, or perhaps a more accessible way of accessing it. I would say that your strategy, if not including all of these elements in it, has at least touches on them and is part of your conversation and part of your thinking. So the homework that I'm going to ask you to do is, as I said, to draft a simple strategy for us to discuss. Um, on the July 14th. I'd like to encourage you, some of you are from, uh, some of you, there are multiple of you from the same institution and some of you are on your own. What I'd like to encourage is that you work, if you are um, with, you have other colleagues in this session that you work with them um, on this strategy. Um, if you are um, uh, working with if there are colleagues um, from other museums that you know um, but not necessarily from the inst same institution i would encourage you to work together um, to um, help each other and to bounce ideas off each other and perhaps if you are from your, uh, the only person from your institution um, but there are other museums in your locality, so perhaps, you know, or other museums with a similar kind of thema theme to you, so a history museum or a science museum or uh, archaeological museum or whatever, that perhaps you try and link up with them, um, again, just to share ideas. Um, but of course, you can also work on your own. I just find it really helpful to, to, to work in collaboration. And then what I hope is that you will draft something um, that has some of the elements that we've just mentioned and that you'll share what you've done and at the next session and we can talk about the learning and we can talk about um, the challenges and how perhaps you might support each other as a community um, going forward. My recommendation and where I always start is with an audit. Um, what are you doing at the moment? Um, as I said, some of you have talked about it today, some of you haven't, but are doing things, and some of you are just started. But if you are uh, doing something to look across your museum, look at the departments and staff that are leading the activity, look at perhaps which audiences you're trying to address. Are you doing uh, resources for schools? Are you trying to uh, make resources for families? Are you trying to do things for academics or research people? Who is the audience and who's missing from those audiences? And are they international, national, or do you really just care about your, lo your local audience? And do you think what you're doing is successful? And how do you know? How are you measuring that? And if you're not, what do you think you need to know uh, in order to understand if, if what you're doing is having impact? And what's missing? What aren't you doing? And what would you like to be doing? going forward. Um, and if you're not doing anything, why aren't you? Um, and what do you need to do to change this? So doing an audit 
is a really helpful place to really understand where your museum is today in this moment. And there is no judgment, there is no like right or wrong, there is no success, there is no failure, this is where you are. And, um, and then move on to creating that outline and to remember the elements. And I, what I would suggest as a minimum to include is the overall vision for your museum. So what's, what are the key priorities and vision for, your, for the museum? Not your digital one, but your overall vision for the museum. And how can digital help you to achieve the vision? How does it, how does it support your overall priorities for the museum? Include that digital audit, audit to show what you are currently doing. And then what other activities do you want to include in the short, the medium and in the long term? And they could be anything from, I've just put a list here, but there could be many other things that, you, that are important to you that you want to consider. And then other things that you may want to include or not are, you know, what resources do we need in terms of staff, in terms of skills training? Who needs to be involved in writing this strategy? And who needs to be responsible for the different areas of delivery? And what might be those big, big, big barriers to success? And how can we tackle them so that they, are, um, that they are challenges that we can think about overcoming? Are they challenges that are external um, and that we have no control over? Are they internal challenges that perhaps we can- uh, I'm having trouble here. Oh, that was Siri um, on my phone, apologies. Um, but if we, what are the things that we can perhaps do internally that we can change? What kind of funding and budget do you need to deliver the strategy? And where might be the opportunities? Is it, is it from your own government? Is it from the EU? Is it partnerships or often, often other kinds of funding or grants? And what could we start tomorrow, next month, in six months and longer term? There will always be something that you can do tomorrow. So just finally, because I know we're at time, the second session on the 14th of July, which I hope you will come back to, I would love you to, um, to uh, uh, participate and, and, and I'd love to hear what you have done. Um, we're going to review what you've done. You're going to share what you've done. We'll do that hopefully in small breakout groups and also together. Um, we'll offer suggestions. Um, about how you might fill in the gaps. So where are the big challenges and the barriers that you've come across? What might be your next steps? What will be the thing that you do tomorrow? And how can you support each other going forward? This is a small group. You've all signed up because you're interested in this topic. So what can we do um, as a group to continue that conversation? I, sorry, I've rushed through things a bit at the end here, but I hope that... Um, what I've presented is clear. And also, um, as I said, I will make the presentation available so you can go back and look at things in more detail. Um, but I really want to thank you for listening today. I, I, I'm sorry it was a kind of rushing, um, but, but um, I'm really looking forward to seeing you again in three weeks and to seeing um, what you come up with um, in your work. So I'll hand back now to uh, ICOM or to Polina uh, to, to, to finish the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolina. It was a very important uh, overview and uh, important lecture and uh, special uh, questions. And uh, I hope uh, until next meeting in the 14th of July, we will have the answer of total museum experience. And uh, we will try. Uh, and I hope everybody will come and uh, we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a, have a great day, everybody. You too. Mm. It's a morning now, no? It's still, still my morning. It's only 10.30. Just <laughs> one second before uh, you all log out. I am Lior, the head of the digital forum. Thank you, Caroline, for a great session. I just wanted to extend uh, mm -hmm. my help. Uh, if anybody needs uh, further help in writing their digital strategy or any, you know, s any sort of another advice, I know Caroline's schedule is pretty busy and she lives far away, but I can help you locally as far as you need. Uh, so feel free to write and uh, use, uh, we have a digital at ICOM email that I'll, I can um, Add to the chat in a second. Uh, Leon, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe you can uh, say it in, in loudly. 
sorry. Uh, so I'll say it loudly again. So I'll give out my email. If there are any advice that I could give as the head of the digital forum, if there's any help you need in making this, uh, then I can offer my assistance uh, before our uh, next meeting. Leo, everybody knows you or you want to introduce yourself? No, we introduce himself. Okay. So I introduce myself, the head of the digital forum, Roche Forum Online and Digital, as the name is. It's my mistake that I didn't introduce you before. Sorry about that. Also, the presentation and uh, of Carolyn uh, will be on our website, ICON website, and the lectures here will be also on YouTube. Uh, Caroline, thank you so much for your time. It was fascinating. And if you have any questions, so the email of uh, the OR is uh, uh, in the chat, so you, you can uh, send him uh, any message. And if you have any questions, you can. Uh, 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 one more, uh, send one us to before. office through the icon, could I, oh, could I, uh, um, one thing before us? we finish, uh, yes, okay. I'm sorry, and a uh, special thanks to Mayan, um, uh, Mayan, uh, uh, wow, sorry, <laughs> Mayan Lavi, uh, for the operation and publication of the project. And uh, we have here today also the other uh, manager of the forum and the um, and we have Galit Gaon today, and uh, Shir Yagamuchi, and uh, Miller, and uh, Fat Haberman, and all of them will be part of this uh, important series, and we will see in the, in the continued lectures. Thank you. Hey, can I add just one thing as well? Um, I just, yes. I, I, know some, um, I know you're all really busy, and you're probably like, why has this woman given us homework? Um, uh, <laughs> it's like another thing for me to do. But I, I really, even if you can just manage a little bit and, and try to have either have the conversations or, you know, do the thinking on your own, I, I really want to encourage you to do that. One, because um, it will, like, you will learn from just doing that and, and being able to share next time with your colleagues will be so interesting yeah. and enable you to participate in the conversation. And the third thing um, is that um, it, will really, it will really help you if you are serious about moving into, di into digital and wanting to be more digitally able museums. This will just give you a framework, a very simple framework to help you to get your ideas down. So I, I'm, I apologize for the homework bit, but I don't apologize for encouraging you to, to do it. And, and, and please take Leo up on his offer um, to, to, um, to talk to him. Um, and perhaps Leo, you can, if you want to communicate with me, if you, if you have any further questions, um, I'd be really happy to try and help um, uh, here as well. So, so please, get, please, please, please do give it a go. As I said, no, there is no, there is no right or wrong, um, but the important thing is to, is to participate. So thank you so much. So thank you so much, Caroline. And again, thank you, Paulina, for this uh, wonderful collaboration um, and Raz, of course, and Nava. And I hope to see you all on our next uh, session. Thank you. Uh, bye bye, everyone. Bye. Hello, hello. Hello.